Okay. Today we're talking about tips for evaluating student performance. And as a professor myself and instructor, I find that this is probably the part that we do the worst in. Uh, we don't always know how to effectively evaluate. So I'm hoping, hoping to give you some good tips today. Remember, as I started the last two series, um, teachers do three things. They plan, they deliver, and they evaluate. So today, we're kind of talking about that evaluation phase of our, our work. And so the web, first webinar was on how to plan. The second was on how to deliver. And today's uh, is on that uh, evaluation. And then the, the next one, which is next Thursday, we'll be talking about some technology tips and tools. So today's webinar has um, these several objectives. I'm going to show you how to create a table of test specification. And I, I think that is a critical piece. And you'll see what I'm talking about when we get there. And then creating cognitive tests. That's the multiple choice written knowledge test. Creating performance tests, hands-on labs, uh, activities that students demonstrate um, that they can do the hands-on work. And then how do you measure attitude? And that's really an important thing. Employers really want us to be able to measure that, and we don't usually do a very good job of that and, and evaluating effectively. So let's talk about the first objective, is creating tables of test specifications for our test. Remember, teachers do three things. Uh, teachers teach three types of content. They teach knowledge, they teach skills, and they teach attitudes. And so uh, I'm going to be talking about how you evaluate all three of those. And remember, we started out by talking about the standards, uh, and, and then you take those standards, turn them into curriculum, and then we do our testing. So there really are four reasons we test. One is maybe to place students. And, and I think we should be doing a lot better job at that. That's where a student takes a test and they say, well, you already know unit one. You don't have to do unit one. We can place you in unit two. Or you already know algebra, so we don't have to have you take algebra. You can go on into some advanced math. So placing, we can use a test to place students. We can also use a test <clears throat> to performative evaluation, in other words, to to be able to provide, how do I give them feedback? And then we've got diagnostic tests. How do we diagnose what is wrong, what the pieces they don't know and they do know? And then summative is like a certification test. And I know PHCC has those summative tests that we created um, that after the end of year one, year two, year three, and so forth. And those are more of the high stakes types testing. There also is an important concept in testing that I want to make sure everyone understands, is that there are normed reference tests. And these are norm reference tests are where we compare students. And so an IQ test compares everyone who's ever taken the IQ test. Um, attitude test is a comparing. Uh, how does one person feel? Or how does one person perform in relationship to the rest of them? And then there's criterion testing, where we set a criteria, and they either make it or they don't. And if they don't make it, we intervene and reteach and let them retest. I only really believe in criterion testing, where we set a criteria. We say, in order to be successful in this job, you have to be able to get 80%, 90%, whatever the score is. And that's the criteria. So again, we're talking about the testing phase of this process. How do we do the certification testing or, or testing students' knowledge? One of the commitments that I make to students is that I will never, ever, ever give a test that I don't give students in advance a test specification. Even on little unit tests, I never give a test, any kind of test, that I don't create a table of test specifications. There are lots of ways to do it. One is you do it with percentages, like chapter one is 10% of the test, chapter two is 60% of the test, and so forth. You can also do percentages with number of items. So you can say that there are three questions on this content, three questions on another content. In fact, on a lot of uh, tests that I do in my graduate courses is I will take the chapter headings 
that are actually just from the table of contents from the chapter. And I will say there are two questions from that section, four questions from that section, so that they govern their study. In other words, if I'm the smart one in the room and I'm supposed to know what's important and what's not important to be successful in this occupation, then I should be able to say these are the heavy hitting parts. And these are the things, there are a lot more questions because it's more important. It's not that you don't read the whole chapter, it's just these are more important. And then we can do cognitive classification and you'll see some of that in just a minute. So all big certification tests have a specification. So here's an example. This is the CompTIA A plus computer specification and it tells them 21% of the test is on a certain section and 11% on a different section. Uh, the FE test for engineers is done the same way. They say their 15% of the test is on mathematics and it even gives a little breakdown. When I do a job analysis and I have uh, the duty areas, then I will say 20% of your test is on uh, the mechanical equipment and therefore if I'm going to do 200 item tests, I need 40 test questions uh, for on that section for that test to be defensible in a court of law. So when I'm going in and developing those summative tests, I better have my ducks in a row and have it weighted based on the importance that people that are doing this job say is the most important. Now remember, underneath the category mechanical equipment, there are d tasks. And so and if I know that I need 40 test questions, I ask in that section, I ask them to rate the 12 tasks that are in that section. And the things that are more important, you can see, are getting more of those 40 test questions. And so it, that's why I might take the chapter in the book and be able to say there are five test questions on that chapter in the book or section in the chapter because that's more important. Now, there are lots of ways to rate tasks. And many times I'll go through the process of taking their job analysis like mechanical equipment and the 12 things underneath it. And I will, this is where I get the calculated. It's an Excel formula as to this is, they rated it a one, which means it's a low rating, and then others that they rated a high. And you can see that's mathematically calculating the number of test questions. I also sometimes ask them to rate it on frequency. How frequently does someone in this job classification do it? monthly, weekly, daily. Uh, criticality, how important is it? Uh, how hard is it? <clears throat> and <clears throat> the other one that I like to have them rate is on level. Level is, uh, does that, is that an entry level task? Or so I know that I should teach it first because they've got to do that as soon as they're out there on the job. Or B is intermediate, maybe that's after two or three years on the job. Or A is, those are only, uh, only senior people would be allowed to do those particular tasks. So I think it's important that you really analyze what you're teaching. There are lots of other categories that when I go out and do this work with clients that I, I might say, tell me what you would like to have them rated on uh, the task. And so some examples are what you're seeing on the screen now. But I might say overall importance. Um, level of responsibility, like someone only assist with this, or they perform it under supervision, or they can perform it independently. This is one that I've been using more and more, uh, rating each of the tasks on if they don't know it. So it's the consequence of not knowing that task. Is there a propensity for personal injury? Is there a propensity for causing or creating a defect? Or is there a, a propensity or impact for uh, harming productivity, uh, in other words, messing up a schedule or time to complete the job. So this is important knowledge for us as instructors to know how we're, uh, how these tasks and how important they are when we're teaching it. So other things might be criticality, uh, like may cause minor problems, may cause major problems, may cause a total shutdown. Important to know those things. Um, another criticality rating. Uh, how absolute frequency, uh, absolute frequency one or two times a year, maybe uh, those kind of things greater than three times a shift. Relative frequency, never perform, seldom perform, occasionally performed, and so forth. Uh, relative time to spend on tasks, much less time than other tasks or much more than other tasks. Uh, time and where you can literally give a number or a range so that you know how much time they spend doing these tasks. Uh, how, how hard it is to learn or teach uh, the task, learning or teaching difficulty. 
uh, just difficulty uh, in and of itself. How hard is that task um, that requires no training or just a few hours of instruction or greater than two weeks of training with some experience? Um, those are these are just important things to know. So now let me start in talking about how do you rate um, cognitive knowledge? How do you evaluate that they got the book learning part? Remember, we're teaching uh, book learning, we're teaching skills, and we're teaching uh, attitude. If I were superintendent of those schools, I would want to give uh, three grades. How did you do on my test, my multiple choice and true-false test? How did you do on fixing uh, a piece of equipment? And what is your attitude? We just take that and say, oh, this is a C student. So they may get A's on your test, couldn't fix a machine if their life depended on it, and have a sucky attitude, and you give them a C. So the idea here is that we have to be able to say, what knowledge do we need to test to be sure they have? And that's what the knowledge part of the testing is. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. So remember the three areas, book learning, uh, psychomotor, and the attitude. So right now we're talking about the cognitive. So remember in the second uh, webinar, I talked a lot about Bloom's taxonomy. And so we tend to write questions on do they remember, like just being able, you know, what year did Christopher Columbus discover America, that kind of stuff. And then the second, a little higher level, do they really understand it or comprehend it? Uh, the third level is can they apply that knowledge in a real world situation? And then the highest level is could they analyze, evaluate with that knowledge, and create something with that knowledge? Now, if you ask industry, they'll tell us, oh, we want them to be able to analyze, evaluate. But we only write good test questions down at the lower level, at the remember and understand level. And so we have to learn to get better at writing higher level test questions to be sure we're really understanding. Can they really apply this knowledge, or can they really use it to evaluate? So remember, there are verbs. And so these can be triggers for you as you look through the chapters, or you look through the objectives, or the, or the job analysis, whatever you have. What are the words you're starting to see? And if it is words like differentiate or words like demonstrate, then you know at what level in the taxonomy that you have to write questions. And one of the handouts, if you recall last at the second webinar I gave you, was some sample questions for each of the six levels of, of knowledge. So you may want to pull that back out when you start writing tests to be sure that you're getting at what it is they really need to do and at what level they have to do it. So let's first talk about items where the student only has to recognize the right answer. So it's multiple choice is one of them. So remember the levels of, uh, of understanding there. So in order to do this, I'm going to give you some, we'll walk you through some examples of multiple choice questions. And it's important that we understand the right terminology. So the red part that you're seeing there, what should be used when cooking pans? Uh, with cooking pans having a Teflon coating. That part is called the stem. The right answer is called the right answer. And the other three are called distractors or foils. I rarely go five uh, items. I always do one right answer and three distractors or foils. I call them distractors. So the stem of the question can be a question, or it can be an incomplete sentence. And that's entirely preference as to what you, you feel like you would like to write. Um, one of the ways to get at a higher level of learning is to put in the STEM, which of the following is the best reason for using nylon uh, utensils. And one of the things that I found with this is that students will take you on with these questions, because all of them are right. It's just one is the best. And so I always, uh, when, when students challenge me on this, when they'll say, well, I really think the best one is because it's easier to clean, then and if they can provide me with a good rationale as to why they think that's the most important, I just give them credit. It's like, you're thinking, that's all I care about. You've got the knowledge. And then I might give a rationale as to why I think C might be the better answer. But I usually give students credit when they start to defend their answers. Um, here's an example of how items can easily be misunderstood. Which of the following woods is best for constructing furniture? Well, redwood would be the most glamorous, maybe 
uh, or maybe uh, best for outdoor furniture. Rosewood is the most glamorous. Pine is the cheapest. So they'll say, we don't know what you mean by that for best. So if, if you do say, which is the best for uh, lawn furniture, then we have an answer that would be appropriate. But then by, when we analyze it, we might say, well, gosh, the answer is, uh, is maybe redwood, but why are so many students picking pine? And it might be because the, the school is so cheap they only use pine, and so the students think everything's made of pine. So why did so many students pick the wrong answer? The other part of multiple choice writing is that the stem of the item has to be the longest part of the item. So when you look at this, the spark plug is, this is basically four true false questions. So you need to turn the item around to where uh, the stem of the item becomes the longest part and then you have your answer and your distractors. Notice in this particular example, they ignite the appears in all of the distractors. You need to then reword the stem so that you're not repeating those words in the distractors. So then you get they ignite the in the stem of the item. The next one is anytime you have the word not in the stem, bold it, underline it, all cap it, because students do miss the word not. And from a testing perspective, we know that it, that it does mess students up, students get, get it confused. I'm saying I like not questions because especially in troubleshooting and getting at those higher level, can they eliminate the thing that would not cause a problem? Um, but if you are going to put not in the stem, be sure that you make it really bold, call, put it color or something. If you do, if, the best, however, is if you can turn it around into, uh, into a positive. Now, one of the tidbits that you might want to consider is uh, at the beginning of, a, of your year or at the, when you just start, if you're a new instructor, <clears throat> you might want to use a bunch of open items, open-ended items. So when should the feeding of whole grain to pigs begin? And all of the stupid answers that they put become your distractors next year. So that might be a little tidbit on how do you get bad distractors. One of the things when you're writing items that have an incomplete sentence, be sure that all four of them grammatically finish the sentence. Students will catch you on that and they'll complain about it. So a few of these don't grammatically finish the sentence. One of the things that is also important, and I don't know if, if all of you know it, but now you know the secret. If you don't know the right answer, pick the longest one. So in this case, the answer is probably B without even reading the question because it is the longest one. So it is important that when you're writing that you try to keep all the distractors uh, the same length. Anytime you have numbers in your uh, distractors, be sure you put them in ascending or descending order. It doesn't matter, but don't mess them up. Just put them in order somehow. One of the things that I really don't like and don't approve of is all of the above, none of the above. So in this case, all of the above is the answer. So this is where I was saying it might be important to say gasoline mileage efficiency is affected by all the following except, and this is a really stupid one, but one of the things that you'll find is can they pick out the one that doesn't belong? And then you find out if they really know the answer or if they're just picking all of the above because it's probably going to be the answer. Now let's talk about true-false items. True-false items have to be absolutely true or absolutely false. And true-false items can only be measuring the lowest level, remember. So if you are going to use true-false, just know that you're getting at no higher level. You're just getting do they know the facts. So copper is a major alloy of zinc. That is true or false. And they, that's the kind of question that you need to be asking in um, multiple choice. So here's an example of how people uh, and students do read stuff in. So the president of ASTD is elected to that office, and the students are thinking, OK, here's the trick. That's the answer. But if the president dies in midterm or leaves in midterm and the vice president takes over, you see, so they figure that you, you're trying to trick them. So the way to avoid that is to be able to say, if this is really what you want to say, don't put usually in there, because then students know that that now becomes a true statement. But the presidency of ASTD is an elective office. That's the statement that becomes the true-false. 
one of the things that we tend to do a lot of times is uh, we try to put too much into a true-false item. So transistorized ignition systems will not function in sub-zero weather. That in and of itself is a true-false item. Then we go and add because of high resistance at low temps. And then we, we don't know if they miss it, we don't know which part of that question they don't understand. So here's another example that is so confusing. It is not unwise. You see the double negative there. So it is really important that you not get double negatives involved in true-false. One of the things that I think is kind of a neat way to do true-false is to do what we call a modified true-false, where we say some of the statements are true, some are false. If the statement is true, circle T. If the statement is false, circle F and explain why it's false. And I think that's a really good way to do true-false. The other one is, uh, yeah, another modification is read the statement. If it's true, circle T. If the statement is false, circle F and change the underlined word to make the statement true. So again, you're, you're using it to get at a little higher rate of knowledge. Matching. There are just a couple things about matching. Uh, whenever you're doing a matching item, do column A contains and you say so-and-so. Column B contains so-and-so. But do not have a one-to-one -one match. So if there are six items on column A, there needs to be less or more in column B. So you should not have an even number in column A and column B. It doesn't matter which way you go, but you do have to have an uneven match. I kind of like this where it says column A presents a problem, column B is a cause, and column C is a solution. And for each problem, they have to give a cause and a solution. That's kind of a neat way to do a matching. Okay, And uh, so this is another example of that. So short answers. Now, short answers are where we're starting now to get where the student doesn't have to recognize the answer. They have to supply the answer. And these are much harder for students. So things like define the automotive term, briefly describe the principle of airflow. Right? So these are kind of essay short answer where they have to uh, write an answer. So here's an example of a bad one, a compass is. There probably are books written on it, and we're asking students to uh, write something. So it may be the way that might improve this item is a tool you have to ask people to, is so-and-so. And then this is where you see if they know the word compass. One of the other things about short answer, a lot of times we put blanks. There should only be one blank per item. So for example, the, the, you take away one of them, uh, one of the blanks. And the other part is it is really better if the blank be at the end of the statement rather than at the beginning. It's just uh, something about our being able to read that. So the blank at the end rather than at the beginning really helps. Now essay items, if you want to do essay items, this is where we can get at that higher level of learning. We can get at do they really understand and can provide us with this. So here's an example where briefly discuss two types of grass used in golf course greens. And students will ramble on and on and on and on. But isn't this a better essay item? Briefly discuss two types of grass used for golf course greens. In your response, focus on differences in watering requirements, cutting requirements, golfer preferences, and repairability. You see how now we're getting to where they're going to tell us exactly what they know. One of the things that I think is really important, and I'm, I'm just going to say this as a um, it, just because I think that we have had, we really messed some students up. We have some teachers that have things like uh, after two typos or after three misspellings, uh, I quit reading. Or you just need to kind of think in your in your mind if you're doing essay, and if you want to know if they know it, then you need to write. You need to be grading that based on the content of the item not on the spelling. If you're a spelling teacher, that's good. But if you're not a spelling teacher, if you're trying to teach them plumbing or HVAC content, maybe spelling isn't something that you take off on. Now, a lot of times I grade these essay items on points, so it's worth 10 points. And if I see a lot of typos or a lot of, um, a lot of like spelling errors, I might take a point off or something for poor grammar and, and suggest they go and get some help with their grammar or spelling. But I think it is important that you understand that if you're giving an essay item on technical content, you're measuring technical content. Now this is the whole idea, and I had showed this, uh, this 
slide in another in the previous uh, webinar. So we have question one, two, three, four, up to question 11. The A1 relates to the job analysis, uh, whatever the A1 task might be, and then the A2 is another or a section in a chapter. The right answer to question one is D. That's what the four mean. The key is the answer. The right answer to question two is D. And here are all the students that took the test, highest score to lowest score. If they got the question right, it's blank. And if they missed it, it tells us what they picked. So you can see right now that in question three, I've got the answer coded as A, but we have most people thinking the answer is B. All of our high-level achievers are thinking it's B. So I probably have something wrong with that question. And so it is important that you analyze your test in order to know who's missing it. Do I, it was, did I just put a wrong key in there? Am I grading it wrong? So I think it's important that you go through some kind of process to look at your questions. All right, so now I'm getting ready to go into the performance test, but I'm going to give an opportunity if anyone has a question regarding cognitive testing and test specifications. Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to go on with uh, performance testing. This is how do you grade a performance test, watching a student perform an activity or a, a job or a, a, a lab. So lots of things that we do in, in our world where we actually perform. It could even be accounting. It could be a plumbing. It could be fixing a car. So remember the taxonomy that I talked about, about you first initiate, you know, the imitate. So the first thing in the first, the first uh, lab that you might give them, they just have to imitate what they saw you doing. And then they start manipulating and, get and then they get precise and then it just becomes a piece of them. So I think it's important that you as the instructor know, this is the first time they've ever done that activity. I need to grade differently than when I grade when it's at a higher level, when they've had lots of time to practice and, done, and maybe have performed this task multiple times. Remember the verbs also on what would you be looking for if you saw the list of verbs. So one of the things, and unfortunately because we're doing this as a webinar, you don't get to see this. So I've got to tell you about an activity I do when I do this workshop face to face. I bake chocolate chip cookies and I tell the audience that they're going to be grading my cookie. And they're going to grade my cookie on um, on appearance, texture, tenderness, and oh, I got texture in there twice. I, I forget now what the fourth one is. But the grading scale, it's worth 30 points. And in order for me to get an A on my cookie, they have to, I have to earn 25 points. And the rating scale is five is excellent, four is good, three is fair, and so forth. So I give them a cookie, and I give them um, a criteria. So golden brown, slightly moist, uniform texture, you see that. And so the idea here, oh, the fourth one is taste. Now I see what the fourth one should be taste. That was my mistake there. So, but do you see the idea of, of it's worth 30 points. If everybody gives me fives, I get 30 points. And so I, uh, students will grade my cookie, and they'll be uh, circling 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. But what they don't know is that half the room got this criteria, but the other half got this criteria, which is exactly two inches in diameter with no protruding edges, contained exactly 10 chocolate chips. You see how this is an example of how it's very specific. And so I give them this, and then I ask, how many gave me an A? And the people that had the first criteria, the first set with golden browns, and that kind of thing, they're giving me A's. This group, because I made the cookies um, to make sure they didn't comply with this, uh, the second group is looking around like, how did they give her an A when she you know, made these, didn't make these cookies well? And then I explain about the different criteria. So the more specific you can get, the, the better that we can have two people grading the same student and coming up with similar scores. So this is the concept. That, that is really important in performance testing. We can grade two things. We can grade process, or we can pray, uh, grade product. So process is where, um, again, you didn't, uh, I just gave you a cookie to grade. You did not watch me make that cookie. So you didn't know if I creamed the butter and the sugar, 
and how I bake the cookies or, or if I just went to Walmart and bought a box and put them in a, in a bag. And so you, students, I, you did not watch me do it. In the beginning stages of learning, process may be way more important than product. In other words, did they, how did the cookie taste? Well, that's, you have to decide, am I going to grade process or am I going to turn over, you just turn in, uh, uh, did it work or not work? For the cookie, you only graded a product. Okay. So you only graded the cookie. And the other thing that's really important, you noticed I used excellent, good, bad, fair. And so it, it, there's really a distinction, and I teach teachers, and a lot of them are vocational teachers, and it's not at all uncommon for me to have a, a culinary art uh, teacher in my class. Well, the cooking teacher's definition of excellent is really different than the poor bachelor who hasn't had homemade cookies in a long time. And so what one of the things that's really important is that the more knowledge people have, the more um, kind of picky they are about your what they're seeing and observing. And so it, it is important that you kind of become more specific in your grading. So I would hope that you would start to look at those kind of things about uh, what's excellent, good, bad might be good, bad to one person, but it might be awesome to another person. So there is that halo effect where uh, because I make chocolate chip cookies for the class, I get good grades because I'm a nice person. But if, if, if I was, a, like if there was a student that I was trying to, to really fail, I now had a right with that, with that uh, scoring thing that I created with excellent, good, bad, fair to say, well, that was bad and uh, without giving them any explanation. So there is that halo effect that I can either use it for you or against you. We also have some raters just always rate high. Some of them are very critical and rate low. Uh, the tendency, however, is to kind of rate people in the middle. So it, understand where you are when you're grading students. But the goal is this inner rate of reliability. In other words, being able to create a scoring rubric so good that two people can grade the same student or the same product or watch the same process and come up with a similar score. So one of the examples that I do, another example that I do is the, the task is that a student has to cut a quarter yard of velvet fabric. So again, the process. Place the fabric on a horizontal surface, blah, 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 and it gives you the list. This, did they do step one? Yep. Did they do step two? Yep. Did they do step three? And then when they turn over the quarter yard of velvet fabric, now I can grade the product. Is it free of dust? Is it cut grain straight? Has it smooth edges? Does it measure a full quarter yard? So you see when they hand me the product, now I can grade it. So when you're grading process, is a yes, no. Did they do step one? Did they do step two? And so forth. And here's an example of one that I like to use is that let's say that making a pot of coffee is 10 steps. And so they do step one, step two, step three, but then when they get to step four where they have to fill the basket with coffee, they didn't do that one. And so they got a 90%, but they never made a pot of coffee because there was no coffee in the basket. So do you see how you have to be thinking about, nope, they got to do all 10 steps to pass. Okay, so that's an important concept to understand in, uh, in process. When you're grading product is when you get into the rating scale. How well is it free from dust? Well, it's excellent or good, but again, we've got that bias as to what's excellent to one person might be poor to another person. So the idea of creating a scoring rubric, and that's what we call these templates that score students, is to be able to get a uniform objective criteria for people to grade this job and watch it, to provide expectations for the students and the instructor so that everyone knows what we're being graded on. So I hand out these scoring rubrics in advance. I never give a lab or an activity that I don't give them in advance how I'm going to be scoring it. And then it just reinforces on what's really important for high quality work. So when I do this, I usually create an evaluator book, in other words, a book for me, that kind of says, okay, be sure you have this equipment, 
uh, allow this amount of time, here's all the tools you need, here are the instructions, and here are, here's the scoring rubric you're going to use to grade the student's work. The candidate gets, this is what you're going to do, you'll have 30 minutes to do it, and these are the things you're going to be graded on, instructions on how to do it. So the uh, step one is to identify the job and write the instructions to the candidate. Here's the parameter. Uh, this is the job you're going to do. Here's the title. You have so much time. And, and do this first. Be sure you put you know, safety glasses or whatever it is that you want them to know. And then you've got the narrative for the evaluator. So here's the materials to have ready. Uh, here, here are the things you have to prepare in advance, how you set the room up, how you make the logistics. If you have to bug a piece of equipment, what do you have to bug or remove or unplug? And recommended sequence so that the instructor has something to know. OK, I'm going to watch them do this first, this second, and any special issues that they may have to do. Then you create the rubric. And here's the rubric that I create. And I'm going to show you how this works, is that you have highly proficient, competent, partially proficient, limited, and major improvement required. Notice that uh, this is writing a business letter. So I'm going to first grade, did they use the right style? And you see points. Now in my world, one of the things that I suggest is that 25 is the most points anything can get. And then it has to be in increments of 5. So this is a 10-pointer. It can be a 15-pointer. It can be a 20-pointer. But 25 is the most. If they get an A, they get all 10 points. If they get a B, they get 80% of the points. If they get a C, they get 60% of the points. So now I can give them a score. And I try, if there are five categories or five uh, scoring rubrics, I make sure that at least three of them have words underneath it as to what an A would look like. What would a C look like? And it may be, well, it's not an A, but it's not a C, so I'll give them a B. All right, so then you, but you have clear criteria as to what's an A, what's a B, what's a C. Now, if you don't like my highly proficient competent, uh, there are lots of other ones you can use. And I'll show you where I've got this for you so that you'll be able to see it. But the, you don't have to use the same ones that I use. Those are ones I tend to use more often. But there are lots of different rating scales that you can use. Uh, the one that I use the most is that highly proficient, competent, partially limited, and able to perform. Um, it, problem solving, you may have an, an A, B, C, and D. Again, could they, uh, what could they do as, as for solving a problem? Uh, another one rubric for problem solving is being distinguished, proficient, apprentice, or novice. So, the first thing that you would do is select the rating scale, like I have in red. And if you don't like mine, put, put whatever it is that you believe would be good rubrics, uh, rating scale items. And then you write underneath what's an A, what's a, at least what's an A, C, and an E. And so that, again, people can read, uh, two people can pick this up and get close to the same score on the same student. Now, I'm going, one of the things that you will find is either going to be in the Dropbox at PHCC or it will be um, something that um, uh, they, he mails to you. I don't know how. But absolutely, this is golden, what I'm going to be showing you now. I created some templates in Excel. So when you bring up Excel, uh, you will see at the bottom, do you see process and product? So this is that example of the process that uh, the one that I showed you about cutting a quarter yard of velvet fabric. So it's uh, an A, B, C, D. They, and remember, process is either they did it or they didn't. And then product is how well did they do it. So that you can just take my template, plug in your own uh, words for job one, and then just change from quarter yard of velvet fabric to whatever it is that you do. Uh, the second tab is an example of this for an ECM machine. So I did this. And I set this up in Excel, where all you have to do is change, yep, they did step one. So I changed the 0 to a 1. And it's automatically, oop, they didn't do step that step. So they get a 1 over here. And then what it's going to do is it's going to score it. And I'll show you that in just a moment. It's the, the cell to see the scoring is in AE 230, cell AE 235. I'll show you that. But do you see how this is process and this is product? So when I scroll down to that, pay, that 235, um, go over and I'll show you, 
you can see that they only got a 20% in being able to do a startup. So these templates that I've created, you just write your words and you can, you can have it uh, actually score it in Excel. Um, the third tab is that example of the letter that I gave you. Uh, the fourth tab is kind of a nice one because uh, this was an example of a health one where they had to uh, do a, an ultrasound of an abdomen. And so the categories they're going to get a score on is could they greet the patient, prep the patient, perform the machine setup, perform the exam, review the film, and conclude the exam. So again, my, using my same criteria, uh, greeted the patient, and you see they're going to grade how well they greeted the patient and the points and so forth. All you have to do is then say, okay, they got a C on this one, they got a B on this one, they got an A on this one, and it's going to say they got an 88% on greeting the patient. So you can create your own rubrics with all my Excel formulas already in there, where they, you, then you just print this and then every student gets a score on how well they did. Here is the template with all those different headings if you don't like my heading. And then I just provided you with a whole bunch of examples that I use in a lot of my consulting. And so this one is a motor control. Here is another motor control. Here's a TIG welding one. Here is an aligned coupling. Here's measurements. Here's a gearbox. Uh, here's a solenoid circuit. Uh, a pneumatic hydraulic and electronic troubleshooting and, uh, and uh, other ones. So this is totally worth, uh, it's worth treasure to you because you're getting it and you, all my templates and all you have to do is plug in uh, whatever that you think might be the words for you. Okay, so I hope that's helpful to you. Now, any questions about, uh, about the psychomotor before I go into the next section? Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to go on to effective. This is how do you measure effective content. And remember, this is attitude, work habit, professionalism. Uh, these are the things that are really hard to, to uh, evaluate. And remember, there is a taxonomy. You have to first receive it, so I might grade differently on if they're just learning it versus if uh, they've been around a while and they should be characterized as doing these things. The problems that we have with effective is that it's really hard to do this objectively. We, we have a hard time with being able to rate someone's behavior. So one of the things that I always like to do is have students rate themselves or have students rate each other. Uh, and that sometimes can be very helpful. But it, well, the other part is sometimes it might be important that you, you say to students, what do you think we should grade, that I should grade uh, on relative to this? What do you think professionalism is? And see if they can come up with words like, well, we agree that professionalism means that you're on time, that you clean up after yourself, and that, and make them have the list of these are the things that we're going, I'm going to grade on because you said that. So in addition to the effective template, I mean to the psychomotor templates, I created another set of templates for measuring the effective content. So when you go again, if they're all in Excel. And so one of the hardest things that I, uh, that I sometimes have with, um, with these, uh, when I create these templates is, well, what's an A, what's a good and what's a bad? So I spent one day, or it took me a couple days actually, of all, I took a bunch of templates I had created for lots of different companies and what they came up with. So you see ability to, I put them in alpha order. So appearance, so several of them, but they each had kind of a different wording on it. Punctuality, behavior, care and use of tools. You see the words following instructions, showing initiative, enthusiasm, judgment, neatness of work area, participation, progress, punctuality, quality of the work, responsibility, work attitude. And so here's the, here's the master list of all the things that I was scoring people on. So if you can't come up with words, use mine. I'm giving you all of these great tools to create a rubric. The other thing that I think is important is this particular one is uh, an example of where you might want to have them rate themselves. And this is a, one of the organizations I work with said, we're going to grade 10 things. We're going to grade, could they follow instructions? How well do you cooperation, judgment, effort, quality, job performance, quantity, job performance, self-discipline, safety, appearance, and so forth. 
And so that's where they, I had suggested that they say, okay, what does follow directions mean? That means you complete the task on t as assigned correctly, you follow the policies and so forth. And, and then you have um, students rate each other and themselves. And that's a kind of a nice little template that you may want to work with. The other thing sometimes I was having trouble with was uh, you, I could come up with what was good, but what was bad. So this is an, uh, an example of the a dichotomous item. So it, for example, boldness or fearfulness, uh, cautious or rashness. So do you see how these gives, this gives you the good and the bad? So you have words. Uh, that's always, for me, the hardest time is to get the words. And then this is the one I set up, just similar to the sonogram that I showed you, where uh, we measured attitude. Get it so you can see that a little better. They measured attitude. Um, they measured comprehension of material, professionalism, uh, reliability, and adaptability, and record keeping, and patient management, and competence. Okay, care and efficiency. All right, so here's the list of the attitude, comprehension of material, professionalism, reliability, adaptability, and so forth. Now, this is a health example, but I think you can easily do it where all I do is I, I go in and I say, well, you're getting a B on this, you get a C on this, you get an, an, an A on this, and then when I go to scroll down to the bottom of the screen, it will say you got an 89% on attitude. So it can, you can actually give students a score on, this, uh, on the behavioral attitude, professionalism, work ethic, or whatever it is, even using all of my descriptors. So I also gave you some interview questions on how could you measure um, uh, some things. A lot of times people want to just interview candidates. So I gave you some list of some uh, questions you might ask if you're trying to see, give me an example of where you showed job motivation, initiative, ability to learn, and so forth. So this, these are some things that I provided for you that I think will be helpful as you start to create these instruments for yourself. Now. That ends my presentation today, and I hope that as you go through this um, development of writing good tests, multiple choice, true, false, and matching, and so forth, and how you go through developing scoring rubrics for labs and projects that the students have to do, and then being able to develop a, 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 an instrument that would measure their, their work habits and efficiency and professionalism and those kind of things. I hope I'm giving you some good tools that you can just cut and paste and make, your, make some excellent uh, tools.